Hey guys, it's me Andrew, your favorite Canadian YouTuber, eh? And today, I will be reviewing a game called Peyote Definitive Edition. When I saw this game announced on April Fool's Day earlier this year, boy was my interest peaked. Before we begin, I'd like to give a very special thanks to Night Dive Studios for providing me with an early review code for this game on Steam. Now, when it comes to old school first person shooters, there's a good chance that a lot of you might not have heard of this game before, as it was rather obscure and not quite as well known as the more popular games of its era such as Doom, Quake, and Duke Nukem. In fact, I actually first heard of this game from the angry video game nerd who referenced P.O.D. in a couple of his episodes. Anyway, P.O.D. was an early FPS game from 1995 that originally released on the Panasonic 3DO, which almost nobody owned, and it eventually got ported to the PlayStation 1. And now, almost 30 years later, P.O.D. finally got an HD remaster on modern platforms. How well does it hold up today? Well, let's find out. By the way, if the game footage looks blurry or pixelated at any point, it's not the game's fault, it's just my computer having trouble recording the game with OBS for some reason. I don't know why OBS had trouble recording and does that at times, but I assure you the game looks and runs much better than the footage you're seeing here. Just wanted to inform you all before getting into the review. The character you play as is a chef named Ox, who served food to crewmates on a spaceship before it got suddenly invaded by aliens that killed the entire ship's crew, and now Chef Ox is the only one left alive to fight off the alien scum using only his trusty frying pan, butcher knife, and whatever weird alien weapons he can find lying around. Honestly, his job was hard enough as it is, and now he has this crap to deal with? It really is enough to make a guy PO'd. Anyway, upon starting the game, the first thing you'll immediately notice is this game is wicked bizarre, and just dives headfirst right into the weirdness pool, no thoughts given. Throughout the game, you'll find yourself fighting some of the weirdest and craziest enemies in any retro FPS game, including walking arses that shoot farts at you, little red things with giant saber-toothed hippo mouths, humanoid lady aliens with two kinds of big guns, three kinds of annoying flying pests that are a pain to hit, green blobs that look like the flamoids from Chex Quest, big hulking dudes that skip leg day, demonic ghostly bubbles that leech on your health, all kinds of weird robots going haywire, and more. Not to mention, certain types of enemies are immune to specific weapons, which I learned the hard way when I livestreamed this game on launch day. Now speaking of which, if you thought the enemies were weird, this game also provides you with some of the zaniest weapons in any FPS game. Well, maybe besides high on life. You start off with a frying pan that does more damage the lower your health is. As funny as it is, it's not a particularly useful weapon, especially when you get swarmed with enemies very early on in the first level. Thankfully, not long after the first room, I found the knife which acts as both a melee and projectile weapon, and it seems the chef has an infinite amount of knives to throw. Once I got the knife, I never really used the frying pan ever again. So, little word of advice, if you don't want to get your arse handed to you early on in the game, both figuratively and literally, then you must remember and obey the wise words of the nerd. Number one, get the knife. Number two, get the knife. Number three, get the knife. Eventually, later on, you get a drill that essentially acts like the chainsaw from Doom, except you're drilling enemies' brains out like in Hotline Miami. Anyway, in level 2, you get your first actual gun, the BFD-90. Yeah, this game is kind of a parody FPS game if you didn't already get it. The BFD is basically a cheesy-looking laser pistol that shoots lightning bolts, and it's especially useful for taking down those annoying flying enemies. Later on in the game, you also get a flamethrower, a gatling gun with tracer rounds, a rapid fire plasma gun, the confusingly named meat seeker which fires quote unquote meatballs that ricochet off walls and enemies, which is really only useful in tight enclosed spaces and you're at risk of getting hit by your own deadly bouncing meatballs too. Oh, and of course, no retro FPS is complete without the traditional rocket launcher. It fires rockets rapidly, though it does feel kind of weak compared to rocket launchers 
launchers and other games of the same era. Luckily, you get a much stronger rocket launcher about 16 levels in called the Missile Cam. As the name implies, the Missile Cam fires missiles that you can actually control manually and steer into enemies. It's basically a lot like the sniper rifle in Bulletstorm, where you steer the bullets into enemies, but I'd say PO'd actually did it better, as you can steer the missile indefinitely for as long as you want until it finally hits something. Though keep in mind, it works much better in wide open areas, whereas in tighter and closed areas, it's a lot harder to steer, and you really gotta perfect your accuracy if you're gonna try to steer it through narrow tunnels to hit a target. It's not impossible, but pretty difficult to pull off. And boy is it satisfying when you land those perfect hits with it. Not to mention, because missile cam explosions are much more powerful than the regular rocket launcher, every missile shot is the equivalent of 10 rockets ammunition, so make sure you don't waste all your rockets or drain them too quickly when using it. In fact, I like to save the game a lot when using it, so that if I miss a shot, I just reload my save point and try it again. Okay, now that I've covered all the weapons, let's get into some of the other game mechanics, starting with the basics. One thing that took me a bit of time to get used to is the walking movement, which feels pretty slippery like you're slowly walking on ice. There is a sprint button, represented by the chef putting on his slippers, which allows him to run much faster and zoom across rooms. So because of the slippery movement, you might not want to sprint all the time, especially in places where you gotta walk on narrow platforms or planks, in which case the slower walking works better for. So you're likely gonna find yourself toggling between walking and sprinting much more often than you would in most retro FPS games. Now, if you find turning around a bit sluggish, depending on if you're using a mouse or a controller, you can look behind you quickly by doing a backflip, which I guess was somewhat unique at the time, but it is pretty disorienting or nauseating in first person, and I never really used it. Now, while the slippery movement does take time getting used to, but once you get into the flow of the game, it's not so bad after a while. But thankfully, you really only have to put up with that obstacle for the first level or two, because in level two, you'll find a jetpack, which is a real game changer from that point on. I gotta say, this was a pretty innovative feature for 1995, as jetpacks and FPS games were kind of a new thing way back then. This even predates Duke Nukem 3D. I gotta say, the jetpack in this game works surprisingly well, and it makes moving through levels a lot less of a chore once you find it. The jetpack also has a speed toggle just like the sprinting, so you can choose whether if you want to fly slowly and smoothly, or just zoom across the map flying at high speeds, which can sometimes be a little bit nauseating when the camera sways back and forth when turning while flying around at high speed. Other than that, you'll find yourself using the jetpack a lot. In fact, the jetpack is actually essential for navigating and traversing through levels going forward, so make sure not to use up all your fuel too quickly. Speaking of which, apparently the jetpack uses the same fuel as the flamethrower, so it's best not to use both the jetpack and flamethrower at the same time, as doing so will drain your fuel twice as fast. It's a good thing there's fuel pickups lying around sometimes. Speaking of which, like in many games, you'll find both health and ammo pickups lying around in various places. I will say the game is fairly generous with the health pickups sometimes, and I guess that's a good thing if you decide to play on the harder difficulties. I played on medium, which is challenging enough as it is. Anyway, there's different ammunition pickups for most of your guns, and you can regain health either by finding green health canisters, or apparently by eating the flesh off the red alien's body. Bodies. Uh, you know what? I won't question the chef box. Anyway, if you're lucky, you'll occasionally find something that provides infinite resource replenishment. Like there are campfires that somehow refuel your jetpack and flamethrower's fuel. Definitely be on the lookout for those. There's also these weird beeping machine things that I had no idea what they do at first. Took me a while to realize they actually replenish your plasma ammunition for your BFD and plasma gun. And of course, there's an item that indefinitely refuels your health bar. And it looks kind of like, uh... Uh, never mind. Moving on. There are a total of 26 levels in the game, including three secret levels. Some of these levels are very large and open areas, while others are more tight and close spaces, though a few levels do have just the right spatial balance. I'll admit, the first level did take me some time to figure out how to exit the level, because I didn't know where the exit was or what it looked like. After killing all of the enemies in the level, it took me over 20 minutes to realize the exit was actually that phasing in and out thing 
thingy I saw earlier in the level. Not gonna lie, I was feeling a little PO'd myself upon realizing that, but hey, at least now I know. Now speaking of the first level, also known as Pompous, that level actually gets reused three times in the game. I don't know if they did that just to pad out the game, but it does feel like a bit of a lazy design choice. The only difference in the next two times you revisit the first level is that the enemies are different. In fact, the first time you revisit Pompous is where you encounter one of the most frustratingly difficult and annoying enemies in the game, which are these weird brain robot alien things on wheels that immediately swarm and bombard you with projectiles that ricochet and bounce off everything like your meat seeker. Words cannot describe how much I hate these things. Anyway, the only other difference is that there's an extra room that wasn't there at the beginning of the game, but that's about it. Now, if you ever find yourself lost in any of the levels, always check the map screen. Now, this was back when video game map screens were still in their infancy, so naturally, this map was a little confusing to navigate at times. It basically operates sort of like a three-dimensional version of Doom's map screen. The parts of the level you haven't been to yet are highlighted blue, while the places you've already been to are highlighted green. Sounds simple enough. By the way, fun fact, Elvis Presley is in this game. And he's not just a random easter egg, but apparently Elvis is also a gateway to one of the secret levels. The three secret levels are optional, but they do contain permanent upgrades for health, ammo, and jetpack fuel, which will really help in the long run. So it's best you find and play through them as well. Though, I was only able to find two of the secret levels, as the third one is much trickier to unlock. According to a guide, I found online, the secret level could supposedly be unlocked by traveling to every room in the puzzle level, which I did, but the secret level entrance just didn't appear. I don't know if it's a glitch or if I did something wrong there, but I'm afraid I had to miss the third secret level, even though I'm pretty sure I did exactly what was required to unlock it. Oh well. Now on another note, while this game does run perfectly fine for the most part, but there were a couple times where the game just started to crash at random, even after early access. The part where it happened the most was on the Tyrans level. After playing about halfway through the level, the game would crash every time I saved. But thankfully, that only happened on that one level for some odd reason. Now, aside from that, this game is very well polished with not a whole lot of noticeable bugs or glitches that hindered the gameplay experience. However, the one and only time I encountered a somewhat almost game-breaking bug was at this particular part of the game. When I hit the wrong panel on this puzzle thing, it shot me up into the spikes on the ceiling. Then when I reloaded my last save point just before I did that puzzle, suddenly gravity just sort of reversed and I got stuck to the ceiling and I couldn't get myself back down no matter what. In fact, the same thing even happened when I loaded back to every previous save point I had. Doesn't matter where I was in the game, that glitch kept me up there and never let me back down. Not gonna lie, at that moment, I started to panic a little bit, afraid that I had lost all my progress and ruined the game. But thankfully, I was able to easily fix it by simply quitting the game and rebooting it back up on Steam. Now my feet are on the ground again. I'll admit that was a rather terrifying moment, but luckily I never encountered anything else like that from that point on. Now, while I'm not really a completionist most of the time, I do like to take things slow by exploring and collecting as much as I feel comfortable doing. Because of that, I've been playing this game for a total of just a little over 24 hours. In contrast to that, there's actually a speedrun achievement for beating this whole game in 20 minutes or less. Honestly, given how long it took me to beat it, You'd probably have to be a speedrunning master who knows every inch of this game inside and out to earn such an achievement. I know I took my sweet arse time while playing, but still, 20 minutes sounds crazy. If you were able to beat this game in that time, call me impressed. So overall, while P.O. isn't a perfect retro FPS game by any means, and there are still a couple things that didn't quite age well, but at the same time, it's still a very fun experience. I enjoyed almost every minute of it, almost, and Night Dive Studios did a great job at remastering and improving the game from its original form. Honestly, from all the stuff I played so far, I think this just might be one of my top 10 games of 2024. Then again, we're only barely halfway through the year. If you're looking for an old school FPS game that's quite a bit 
different from the norm and just goes all out with a flat out unhinged weirdness, then I think this game is for you. When comparing it to other classics of its era, while I wouldn't put this game on par with some of the build engine big boys like Duke Nukem, Shadow Warrior, or Blood, I would say it's at least an upgrade over the original Doom in some ways. I'd say it's somewhere in between Doom and build engine classics in terms of both its innovative game structure and overall fun experience as an old school FPS game. I gotta say, the Kex engine really did wonders for this game, just like Night Dive's other amazing remasters of classic FPS games. In my opinion, P.O. is definitely one of the more underrated retro FPS games of its era, and it hasn't gotten nearly the amount of love or recognition it deserves. Doesn't exactly help that it came out on an overpriced gimmicky console that almost nobody owned, but hopefully that'll change soon with this new, better, and more accessible remastered version of the game. P.O. Definitive Edition is available on all modern platforms, including Steam, Xbox One and Series X, PlayStation 4 and 5, and Nintendo Switch. For a price of 20 bucks, I'd say it's worth it. Thank you all for watching my review of P.O.'s Definitive Edition. What are your thoughts on it? Do you plan on getting this game? Please let me know in the comments below.